Nero's RGB 660 lights are a pretty popular budget studio light used by many YouTubers and photographers alike. The light supports Bluetooth connectivity, but as anyone who owns these lights knows, the Bluetooth connection is horribly unstable. Short distance and the app for controlling the lights never works. In this simple guide, I will show you how you can build a Wi-Fi controller for your newer RGB 660 lights that will provide a stable connection via Wi-Fi without range limitations and which will allow you to seamlessly integrate the lights with your favorite controls platforms like Home Assistant or Bitfocus. Focus companion. Let's get started. To build the Wi-Fi controller, you will need a few simple electronics components and some tools. I will list everything here on screen. You can find the list and links to all of these components in the description below and on my blog, link also below. The project is pretty straightforward and a great way to get your toes wet when it comes to DIY electronics. But if you don't feel comfortable using a soldering iron or don't have access to all of the required tools, you can also just buy a fully assembled newer RGB 660 Wi-Fi controller through the link in the description too. First, we'll start with attaching the header pins to a D1 Mini. This is the heart of our project. It provides Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connectivity and runs the firmware that allows us to connect to the light. Let's get it out of its bag. It comes with a bunch of header pins, but no right angle ones. We got those separately. This is an ESP32 room. Make sure you get an ESP32 and not an ESP8266. They both come on D1 mini boards and are marketed similarly. Just use my links in the description if you want to make sure you get the right one. Find the pin row that has both the VCC and G pins. You can find the labels on the back of the board. This is where we want to attach our header pins. Cut the header pins to length and test fit them. We will now need to solder the header pins onto the board. Connect the first pin. Reheat and reseat it using some tweezers if necessary. Then connect the remaining pins. If this is your first time soldering, there are a lot of good instructional videos out there, but here are a few quick tips. Use Flux Core Solder. It makes your life easier. Clean the tip of your soldering iron and apply fresh solder to the tip before each new solder joint. The solder on the tip will help conduct heat to the components that you are soldering. Apply heat to the pin or component, not the solder. Apply the solder to the pin component, not the iron. Keep the soldering iron in contact with the pin or component after you have applied the solder to help the solder spread. When soldering through-hole components, make sure to contact and heat the copper ring around the through-hole too. This will make sure solder fills the hole and you get a good connection. Looking good. Next, we will attach header pins to the buck converter. The buck converter steps down the 15 volt that the newer power supply provides to 5 volt that the ESP32 needs. We are going to use some of the header pins the D1 Mini came with. We'll just clip off four individual pins from the row, one for each corner of the buck converter. There we go. We'll use an old breadboard to help us hold the pins in place while we attach them to the buck converter. This is not necessary, but makes it so much easier. Put one of each pin in the right spot on the breadboard to line up with the through holes on the buck converter. And then just slide the buck converter board in place. Attach the four pins using solder. Perfect. We want to lay out everything on our prototype board before attaching anything permanently. Put the terminal block and barrel jack in place. Make sure to get the breadboard friendly 2.5 by 5.5 mm barrel jack like this one. These other ones will not fit into your prototype board. Now seat the buck converter and the D1 Mini upright. Make sure everything is placed and fits. Take the buck converter and D1 Mini off again and sew the terminal block and barrel jack down. Put the buck converter back in place. If you have trouble with it staying in position to solder it, simply slightly bend over some of its pins on the back. You can do that with virtually any component if you're struggling with keeping it put. Solder down the four pins. Next up is the D1 Mini. Attach it along the side of the buck converter. Bend over some of the pins if you need to and then solder them down. It's time to actually connect our components. We will need to connect power and ground between the terminal block, the barrel jack and the buck converter input pins. 
and we will need to connect the buck converter output pins to the VCC and ground pin on the D1 Mini. Since we will be connecting a barrel plug to the terminal block, we should determine which lead goes into which terminal first. We'll need to know which lead of the barrel plug goes to the sleeve and which to the tip of the plug. The best way to determine that is to use the continuity mode on a digital multimeter, like this one. Continuity will make the multimeter beep if there is a connection between the two multimeter leads. We'll insert one multimeter lead into the barrel plug and touch the barrel plug leads with the other. When the multimeter beeps, we found the barrel plug lead connecting to the tip of the barrel plug. We will screw down each of the leads to the terminal block so we know which lead is which and which terminal connects to the sleeve and which to the tip of the barrel plug. But the cable the barrel plug came with is way too long. Let's trim it down. This is much better and all we need. Screw down the leads. And then double check which terminal goes to the sleeve and to the tip of the plug. Perfect. This terminal is hot and this one is ground. We need to connect the hot terminal to the tip of the barrel jack. The pin that connects to the tip is the one that's furthest away from the barrel jack opening. Let's verify that. Yup, looks good. Now we need to connect the hot terminal to the barrel jack tip. Make sure to not get confused which pin is which when you flip the prototype board. Cut a little piece of wire to length. Next we'll want to tin the tip of the wire. This just means to add a little bit of solder to it. It will help with making the initial connection. I use a pair of tweezers here to hold the wire in place since it may get hot. Make an initial connection by reheating the solder joint for the pin and holding the tint wire closely against it. Now remove the soldering iron and let the joint cool off again. We'll need to work on that connection some more in just a second, but for now this will do. Next carefully bend the other end of the wire in place. Trim the sleeve and get the wire lined up with the destination pin. Be careful to not break the initial connection on the other end of the wire. Solder the wire down, making use of some tweezers to make sure it's seated well if necessary. Now we'll reinforce the initial solder joint on the other end by adding some more solder and using tweezers to hold the wire in place. Next, we connect the ground wire. It's the exact same process. Tin the tip, initial connection, strip the other end, fit the wire, apply solder. Verify you have a good connection using a digital multimeter. Connecting the input pins of the buck converter is done the exact same way. First connect the ground to the negative input pin. I accidentally stripped all of the sheeting on this wire. This is fine as long as it doesn't close any unwanted connections somewhere. I'm stripping some wire ends and unnecessarily long pins to clean up the back of the board a little. Connect the hot wire to the buck converter positive input pin. The connection is good. We'll need to wire up the buck converter output pins to the VCC and ground pin of the D1 Mini. However, before we do that, we need to dial in voltage levels of the buck converter first. There's a small screw on the buck converter that when turned counterclockwise will reduce its output voltage. Plug in the power source into the barrel jack. I have a bench DC power supply here dialed to 15 volts, but you can just use your light's power supply too. You'll want the little light on the buck converter to light up. Get your digital multimeter and measure the output voltage on the buck converter output pins. It should be around 15 volts. Use a small screwdriver to turn the tiny screw on the buck converter counterclockwise to reduce the voltage. It will take quite a few turns for it to go down. Measure the voltage again. I got around 13 volts now. Keep repeating this until you reach 5 volts. If you go too far, just turn it back up a little again. This here is good enough. Next, we'll connect the buck converter output pins to the D1 Mini VCC and ground pins. Identify the right pins on the back of the D1 Mini board. It should be pin 3 and pin 4 respectively. Wire them up just like you did before.
Once done, you can reconnect power to the board and see if it works. The little red LED on the D1 Mini board should light up. If you have 3D printed the backplate, you can now attach the board to it. If it fits loosely, use a little super glue to prevent the board from falling off later. There we go. Time to install it. Simply seat the board in the back of the battery slot and slide it down. Then take the barrel plug attached to the board and plug it into the light. Take the barrel plug of the light and plug it into the barrel jack on the board. The little orange LED on the buck converter should turn on, as well as the red LED on the D1 Mini. Congratulations, we're done building a newer RGB660 Wi-Fi controller. Now you only need to flash the firmware to it. You can find the instructions on how to do that in the description below and in this next video. See you next time.